Okay, we have a uh, quorum uh, present, and uh, we have uh, three bills uh, this morning, uh, Senate File 278 by Representative Mann, and um, House File 2542, Representative uh, Houseman, and then House File uh, 2849, Representative Bernardi. The uh, Houseman bill deals with uh, housing, and uh, the Minardi bill, uh, there's been a fair amount of publicity about Ar Argosy University, so that's one that uh, we'll be moving uh, out of the committee today as well. So uh, with that, uh, Representative Olson, would you like to move the minutes? Mr. Chair, I move the minutes from April 25th. Okay, that motion is before us. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, Representative Liebling, would you care to move the division report? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move adoption of the Health and Human Services Finance Division Report for Senate File 278. Okay, that the motion is before us. Any discussion? Uh, seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that Senate File 278, the first unofficial division engrossment, be recommended to be referred to the Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration. Okay. Um, because of the uh, deadline requirement, it does have to go to, uh, to rules from this uh, committee. Um, we will have, uh, we might as well take the amendment uh, now, Representative Liebel, and you want to move the amendment because this bill did um, go in one of the omnibus bills, but the Senate is tracking it separately. So that's why it's before us as a separate bill this morning. So if you could move uh, the amendment and then we'll have the bill in the order that it needs to be. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the A1-1 amendment. Um, and I think the chair explained the reason for that. Yeah, so we're, um, maybe Mr. Marks can comment, but we're, we have to make sure we don't double count the uh, expenditure relative to the budget resolution. Mr. Marks. Mr. Chair, this is, this is just because the similar appropriate or the same appropriations were also in the Health and Human Services Finance Bill. So this is stating that if, if they would get enacted more than once, they're to be given effect only once. Okay, so that the motion is before us. Uh, any discussion? Uh, seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, Representative Mano, if you would uh, care to explain the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, House File 728 uh, deals with the pharmacy benefit managers or the PBMs, their licensure and transparency. A uh, very brief overview, a pharmacy benefit manager or a PBM is a middleman between the drug manufacturer and the health carrier or pharmacy, essentially. They once had a role in processing prescriptions and negotiating for the lowest drug price. Uh, and this, slow, this role slowly expanded. And what ended up happening is that they positioned themselves in a very lucrative space as the gatekeeper between the drug manufacturer and eventually that drug reaching the patient. And so they started requiring kickbacks or rebates from the manufacturer in order to place their drugs on a formulary that would eventually reach the patient. Um, as you can imagine, this is a very large conflict of interest. And what we found is that money started getting siphoned out of our healthcare system and drug prices started increasing. Um, and that's just one of, one of the things that is going on in this system. We know that PBMs are currently taking home $10 billion nationally, and that almost 80% of the market is monopolized by three organizations. Uh, most importantly, aside from the fact that the PBMs are siphoning money out of our healthcare system and pushing that cost to patients, is that they're making really big medical decisions that lead to real life consequences, ER visits and hospitalizations, when formularies are changed without notice. Um, and so what this bill does is it requires the PBMs to be licensed. Doctors, nurses, hospitals, everyone else is licensed uh, to practice medicine in the state except for the PBMs. And it also requires their complete transparency in their dealings so that we know where our money is going. This is our fifth committee stop. I don't have any testifiers, uh, but I'd be happy to take any questions and Mr. Berg can answer any financial questions as well. Okay, and we're quite familiar with Mr. Berg, who's been before the committee previously. Um, Ms. Conley, who watches things very closely, happened to note that in the motion, it was said house file. Oh. No, in the, 
Oh, it was Representative Mann that said House file. Oh. Yeah, we're working with the Senate yes. file, just so. But the motions were correct. Okay. So we're all right then. Um, any uh, questions uh, of Representative Mann about the bill? Representative Hamilton. Oh, yeah. uh, Mr. Chairman, not a, not a question, but a comment. I simply want to say thank you. This is uh, uh, much needed and uh, long overdue. I have some personal stories as far as battles with pharmacy benefits managers, but I'm going to save those for the floor. I did share them in the Health and Human Services Finance Committee, uh, but uh, this is greatly needed. So thank you, Representative Mayor. Thank you. Any further uh, discussion? Representative Liebling, would you care to renew your motion? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And before I do that, I also want to thank Representative Mann for carrying this bill and working so hard on it. This is a bipartisan measure. Um, I believe that the Senate also has a lot of interest in this. And I, I, it is one of a number of measures to begin to control the cost of pharmaceuticals in our state, which is a lot of what is driving the cost of health care and also literally killing some Minnesotans. And uh, so this is long overdue, and thank you, Representative Mann. Um, I renew my motion that Senate File 278, as amended, be recommended to be referred to the Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration. Any further uh, discussion? Seeing none then, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. When uh, Representative Liebling talked about the uh, bipartisan nature of the bill, um, I was reminded, I think it passed the sentiment, Senate unanimously, so uh, very strong support for the bill. So good luck in the rules. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here. Uh, we'll now go to the uh, housing bill. Uh, that's uh, Representative uh, Houseman. And um, Representative uh, Houseman, would you care to uh, move the uh, division report? I move it. Adoption of the Housing Finance and Policy Division Report for House File 2542. Okay, the uh, motion is uh, before us. Any discussion? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Um, and um, Representative Houseman, would you care to make another motion or move I, the bill? I move that House File 2542 as amended be recommended to be placed on the General Register. That uh, motion is uh, before us, and I see there's two amendments. Yes, yes, Mr. Uh, would you uh, care to move Amendment uh, A9? Um, I will move uh, the A9 amendment. This comes to us from uh, MMB uh, Technical Corrections to make certain that the bill can be implemented as it's intended. Okay, any uh, discussion on the A9 amendment? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. And Representative Houseman, then there's the A-10 amendment. Um, Mr. Chair, I would also move the A-10 amendment. Uh, this is not new language either. This um, uh, relates to modular homes and manufactured uh, housing, which is an emerging issue that we've spent a good bit of time on. Okay, that uh, motion is uh, before us. Any discussion? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, Representative House. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, in the Senate, um, they have combined both policy and finance. I had kept them separately. You, you voted on the, the finance bill on the House floor this uh, past week. Um, this deals primarily with um, uh, tenants protection and uh, manufactured and modular homes and modifies the Bond Allocation Act. It's all policy this is uh, we pa we pass them separately but somehow i hope they match up in conference committee so our language uh, can be discussed okay any uh, discussion well see now would you care to renew your uh, motion representative houseman uh, i renew my motion that house file 2542 as amended be recommended to be placed on the general register okay, the uh, motion is before us any further discussion seeing none then all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. aye. opposed Motion carried. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. We now have um, Representative uh, Minardi uh, has the uh, bill dealing with the uh, RC uh, University uh, situation. And we'll give you a chance to get to the front uh, table. Uh, Representative Bernardi, would you care to uh, move the division report? Sure. I move the adoption of the Higher Education 
Finance and Policy Division Report for House File 2849. Okay, the motion is uh, before us to adopt the division report. Any discussion? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carried. Uh, would you care to uh, move the bill, Representative? Yes. Mayor? I move that House File 2849 as amended be recommended, be recommended to be referred to the Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration. Okay, the uh, motion is before us, and uh, would you care to explain the bill and maybe comment briefly on why the bill is needed? Sure. Members, we're here before you today to address and help the students who are former students of Argosy. Argosy is a for-profit uh, institution in Minnesota that went out of business before the end of the most recent semester. These students, um, this helps the helps the uh, financially the students who they were they will allow them to be released from their student loans that they took out for spring of 2019. Uh, there's a lot of intricacies to this because some students were told to withdraw and they withdrew and so it addresses those types of issues as well as, um, well, the Office of Higher Ed is the experts on this, but we had hearings, is very emotional. Kleenexes were not only distributed along for the members, they were just, the pages distributed them in the, um, the um, t people that were here, here to talk about this. It's very emotional and we've worked really, really hard to make our students whole and be able to get them on to, and when I say we, I'm including myself with the Office of Higher Education, but it has been a team effort because some things have been easier than others and students, most of the students in the number of programs that they provided will be able to finish their programs through another way and we still have like one or two more to tackle that are very specific programs. But I just want to commend the bipartisan support that we had on this. We were closely with the Republicans in the House and Democrats, as well as um, I asked Paul Anderson to chief author the bill in the Senate. And so we've been working to help these students as quickly as quickly as possible. So I have Commissioner Olson here today to um, provide some briefing as well. Okay, Commissioner Olson, would you like to come in? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dennis Olson, Commissioner of the Minnesota Office of Higher Education. Um, and we too thank uh, Chair Bernardi and the leadership of the Higher Education Committee for uh, agreeing to take this bill as well as the uh, Senate Higher Ed Committee under the leadership of uh, Senator Anderson. Uh, this bill is, is critically important to the students that were displaced uh, due to the midterm closure of Argosy University. And um, like Chair Bernardi said, most of the students that were displaced, uh, over a thousand students were impacted. Uh, majority have found uh, a pathway to complete their program. However, um, the, in the process of, of ramping up to closure, Argosy University entered uh, court appointed receivership and the receiver had interest in um, selling the campuses to hopefully make the, uh, the business whole again. And unfortunately that didn't happen and in the process, uh, students' financial aid that was due to them, primarily their um, their awards over and above tuition and fees that were due to Argosy University were not paid to the students and were utilized instead to make payroll and pay for other expenses um, to keep the, the university afloat while it was in uh, court-appointed receivership. And so this bill uh, provides the Office of Higher Education the authority to pay the students directly for the um, state financial aid awards that they are due over and above uh, tuition and fees. I've got a, a question. What happens uh, relative to if they're not finished transferring to another institution? Will those credits uh, transfer uh, for the students? <laughs> yeah, in, in many cases they will. And I have uh, Miss Betsy Talbot here as well from the Office of Higher Education who uh, can speak to those specific pathways and uh, opportunities where Students are still struggling with uh, some of the transfers, but for the most part, uh, most students have found um, other institutions to complete their program. But Mr. Chair and members, if I may turn it over to Ms. Talbot. Yeah, if, you'd, uh, if you heard the question, if you could comment, I was uh, interested uh, in making sure that the students have an opportunity to transfer their credits to another institution uh, so that uh, they're held harmless in that regard as well. 
Chairman Carlson, uh, I'm Betsy Talbot. I'm the Manager of Institutional Registration and Licensing at the Office of Higher Education. In short terms, I'm responsible for the state authorization of the private colleges in the state of Minnesota. So when a school closes like Argus University, it's always less than ideal when the institution closes midterm. We work very aggressively, is probably the best word, with all of our local institutions within the state of Minnesota to find transfer pathways for those students. And so there are, there are about, there was about 34 unique programs at Argus University at the time of its closure. We have found uh, more than one transfer pathway because we do encourage uh, student choice for all but one program at this time. And as an explanation just for the students who, where the term ended in the middle of the term, there are some classes that the students were able to complete just because they kind of had a, some classes that were 15 weeks, some classes that were seven and a half, some that were five. And so there are transcripts and we have those that show the credits that they were able to complete from the term. And they can, you get transcripts from our office for free to use those to, to get transfer, again, transfer to a new institution. If the student is not able to find a transfer pathway, then they are eligible to clo uh, apply for a closed school discharge for their federal loan usage through the U.S. Department of Education. And so we're finding that students are making the choice to do that and start over in a different type of program. And some students, again, are, are the majority of them are transferring to new institutions to complete. Just a follow-up. Do you find other uh, institutions have been uh, cooperative in trying to... Uh help the students that are kind of innocently caught in a situation that was not of their making? Uh, Represent uh, Carlson, yes. We have been extremely appreciative of the Men's State system and our private colleges in the state of Minnesota for stepping up. They have received waivers from their accreditors for traditional transfer limitations. They've applied to their accreditors to offer new programs that they have never offered before to help these students. We even have an institution, Adler University, um, Adler Graduate University is offering up free space in their college to allow a Chicago institution to come in and offer a teach out for one of the harder to place programs because they don't, we don't have an equivalent program in the state. So it's been really impressive and how these institutions have been so compassionate and helpful for these students. We actually held a transfer fair at the Office of Higher Education on March 15th, and we had approximately 34 schools come to help these students transfer. And we gave about several thousand transcripts out to students who came to that transfer fair, again, so they could immediately communicate with the institutions to help them transfer. Okay, thank you, Representative Scott. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I have a three-part question. One is how much do we expect the total amount of relief to be um, for these students? B, where is the uh, money coming from? And C, what have we done to prevent this from happening in the future? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Olson or well, whoever. Representative Carlson, Representative Scott. Uh, so on, I'm using the fiscal note and we have on table one on page three, it talks about does this bill result in additional costs for the Office of Higher Education? Um, these students that are receiving these funds that are grant programs, were their entitlement programs where we would have been paying these funds already. And so we want to make a distinguish between the loan forgiveness program that is a flat additional cost to the agency and then the grant programs where it's, there's a difference. So in the third column, it talks about the additional cost of $181,293. Um, and the amounts uh, that we're actually dispersing is 245. So I'm going to primarily talk about the additional cost column and not the amounts dispersed. So the, we have sources of funding for that 181,000. First is uh, we just discovered this this week. I'm, I'm, I'm good actually. I have a lot of memorized things. <laughs> <laughs> we discovered that the receiver did not cash one of the checks that we sent them to make the disbursements directly to students, and that was for approximately $7,000. And that fund, um, we, will, we have put a stop payment on it because now we're gonna make the payment directly to the student, and then we'll notify the receiver of that, that they will know that they need to, they can back that off the student account and that the, fund has, the student has received that entitlement. Then the second uh, source is that during this process of the court receivership, we discovered that the Argosy had 
maintained a separate kind of trust account, specifically labeled Minnesota State Grant, and that fund had $62,000 in it, and the court is holding those funds, and we are intervening in the case with the Minnesota Attorney General's Office help to retrieve those $62,000. And then the third source is, and this is this is primarily for the self loan funds, is it was a violation of the participation agreement to withhold student refunds from students. And so it is a violation that we are gonna try to claim on a bond. And that would should, if we are able to successfully claim all that from the bond, we will be more than will be made whole basically through this whole process. Um, if that's not able to happen, we will have to use um, just a small percentage of reserves from the self loan that is used to cover defaults for defaulted loans. So that's kind of how we're classifying this, just so that again those students can be made whole. Representative Scott. So, um, wanting to know if um, if if the um, money should go back to the grant program to make that whole. And then just if Representative Bernardi, Chair Bernardi could speak to what we do to make sure that this doesn't happen in the future with some of these private colleges. Thanks. Uh, like a good question to yes. both the Chair and maybe Mr. Olson as well. Representative Bernardi. Right. Thank you, Representative Scott, for that question. We and we were taking this as a two-step approach. We're making these, kids, these uh, students whole and um, helping them be able to finish out their programs first. I believe, and I may... I believe I understand that this is not common for the um, uh, institutions going out of business to have taken or have not given the students their money, and so uh, this is a new a new um, challenge, and we are going to be addressing this over the interim on a bipartisan basis, figuring out what we can do in the future to prevent this from happening, and. Um, there's, I've learned a lot from Betsy and Commissioner, oh, so Ms. Talbot and um, Commissioner Olson about the, well, kind of the tricks that they do to show, um, we, we follow currently, we follow what the federal, the federal government does to um, determine if it's, um, I can't remember the word, viable, sustainable, financially viable institution, and it's two years behind. And that we're finding out is not a, um, it's not good enough. And then when they do go through a process, as I understand what some of these places will do is put a whole bunch of money into the account of that university to make sure that it looks like it's viable. So we're gonna be addressing all these angles and um, coming up with probably legislation in the next, well, by next year to help prevent this in the future. Uh, Mr. Olson. Yeah, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair and Representative Scott, uh, just to reiterate that we have committed at the Office of Higher Education to working over the interim to develop a comprehensive package. This is a one-off to provide uh, immediate relief to those students specific to Argosy University, uh, but we do know if, if this happens in the future, we want additional student protections. Uh, we also want to improve that timeline so that we have uh, more opportunities sooner uh, to to look at financial viability scores, to work more closely with the U.S. Department of Education, and to have some additional state authorities um, if we find that the U.S. Department of Education uh, process is lacking. Uh, we also do need additional bond language, uh, probably to increase our protections uh, to protect the taxpayer resources around state grant and other uh, state financial aid programs. And uh, thirdly, I would just say we need to work closely with our financial aid managers in the Office of Higher Education to make sure that we're not um, creating something that has unintended consequences for other students that, you know, we know that we're addressing the issues and not creating additional problems. And Representative Scott. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And so the question about restoring the state grant fund with some of these, if you're able to recover some of the funds, will that be put into the state grant program where it came from? Thank you. Just don't. Yeah. Uh, Representative uh, Carlson and Representative Scott, yes. So the state grant I do anticipate to be made whole um, from those funds that we're going to be specifically recovering, like the stop check and the, um, the $62,000 exceeds the amount specifically that the state grant is going to have a double payment of. And so we, the state grant program is the, and the child care grant, the Minnesota GI and Minnesota Indian Scholarship are the ones that we know that we will have recovery for. And then we're having to use that resource of that bond to make the self loan program whole. Thank you. Representative Hurtas. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And my question had to do a little bit on the order of yours with regard to the curriculum and credits. And if somebody else has a fiscal question or want to get through, I can wait till the end. We have some on the list here, so if, if you want to wait, that's fine. Uh, Representative Dabney. <coughs> Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I'm not sure if my, what they started as questions, I think Representative Scott got us on a, a good start, so thank you for that, but they may have turned to comments instead, but I, I do wonder about the state's fiscal oversight of private, uh, of for-profit colleges. This, this isn't the first one that is, has gone belly up. This is just the current one. Um, as I recall, I, I tend to think in, in terms of analogies. Where, where do we do other things that might be helpful to think about here? Um, I recall, if I recall correctly, Chair Mariani could uh, correct me, I'm sure, but with charter schools, we, re we re I believe we require them to have a plan on what would an orderly unwinding look like. If you're going to close this charter school, who could take on those students, who could take on the program? Um, and I wonder if, if, if we don't have requirements that for-profit colleges have a plan like that and share it with the state if that's a place we should go. Um, and then again, an analogy in, I believe it's federal labor law, we require if a institution, if a company is going to do a mass layoff, that there's an orderly uh, and a lengthy timeline so that those workers can then come to the state and uh, apply for retraining and, and educational support and that sort of thing. And I wonder if there shouldn't be a requirement uh, similarly on for-profit colleges that they give the students a heads up that we're, you know, approaching the financial shoals. And before you sign up for another semester, maybe you should know that. Because while we're dealing with the financial challenges here, both for the state and for the students, the disruption uh, to students' education uh, is another dimension that I think the state should be concerned about. Uh, I'm hearing from supervising psychologists who are wondering where the supply of future psychologists is going to come from, given that Argosy was a significant uh, provider. And in a state that is a, has a crisis with the availability of trained professionals in the mental <coughs> health field, losing Argosy uh, is a real challenge uh, for meeting the needs of Minnesota. So I I just urge that we think about the financial oversight plans for orderly unwinding if that's what you're going to do and timeline on that to give uh, staff as well as students the opportunity to anticipate and make plans and avoid a crisis. Thank you. Maybe uh, just a quick follow up to your Certainly, question. Uh, we've had um, in my time that I recall two uh, colleges that uh, closed for whatever reason. Uh, one was in Winona, and uh, the question there was, uh, where, where are the students' records and so on mm -hmm. uh, deposited? Mm -hmm. that, that was a private uh, college. I forget the name of it, but we did Saint find Therese. out. What was it? St. Therese. Therese. Okay. And we found out that the records and so on would be held, uh, I think it was by St. Kate's up in, up in St. Paul. But that became an important issue for mm -hmm. students that, that, and it was a long, probably went back almost to statehood, you know, so there would have been uh, a long history of the need for records. And the other one was a junior college uh, in Golden Valley operated by, um, uh, uh, well, it was affiliated somehow with uh, Augsburg, or at least that's where <laughs> the records were deposited uh, at Augsburg. <laughs> and, um, so uh, Golden Valley Lutheran <laughs> College, I think, was the title or the name of it. So uh, the point is that it's important to have a planning process in place or some Carlos? some way because I assume some of these students with Argosy uh, who have graduated will be applying for jobs and so on. There will be a need a for uh, somebody to be able to check on uh, the records and what their degree was and all of those kinds of things. So you're shaking your head, yes. So I assume something is being done in that regard as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, we got several people. So Representative Lilly is next. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Chair Bernardi. And uh, thank you very much for doing this. Uh, it really is a, um, I'm lucky enough to be on your committee. And uh, I heard that uh, testimony and what you said with the uh, Kleenex is spot on. Um, Hats off to the new commissioner here and his team. Uh, you've really uh, taken this on. Uh, uh, we liked you, at least I did, liked you already from the get-go because uh, that other senator or whatever he was from Minneapolis so wasn't the best. So 
you're doing a great job already with <laughs> just replacing him. But anyways, uh, you're, uh, no, you've really been great. And, uh, oops, I'm getting a look from the chair, but okay. <laughs> but no, it, uh, this is a very serious issue and uh, uh, hats off to you, Chair Bernardi, uh, for bringing it forward and nothing partisan about this in the least. Uh, the, the testimony we heard was uh, super sad, and we're hearing some of the uh, comments today from other members here about the, you know, it just these were people that were close to getting their degrees and just to get their legs cut out from underneath them. And, I mean, think about it right now. We're in May. We're probably writing some graduation letters. That's what these people were uh, looking for doing. Um, it was amazing. The teachers offered to teach for free you know, to finish up. Some of them were so close, just literally hours away from getting uh, certificates and other things and just uh, the brutality of this thing. And then uh, keeping the money from the people too, like living expenses and um, that these uh, folks expected uh, paying rent and all sorts of different things. But Chair, Chair Bernardi, thank you for bringing this forward. And we did uh, talk about future and dealing with other issues and and I know you have plans to have hearings on that, but uh, boy, these, these stories are really sad and they really affect people, our neighbors, all in all of our communities, not nothing partisan about this in the least, but uh, thank you and thank you to the Office of Higher Ed. Representative Hurtas, I understand you're ready to... Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess uh, the conversation is going a little bit direction where I wanted to go as well. Um, it's been decades since uh, I attended higher education institutions, but even in having attended three, <clears throat> I believe three different colleges, I uh, found my experience that not always did your credits transfer, that there was always uh, some lack of continuity. And although we strive right here to make these uh, students financially whole with regard to the monies paid for their courses, they'll never be whole in terms of the time they've invested in getting halfway through a course or curriculum uh, nor the, the time and energy uh, uh, that they'll have to start over in some uh, respects. Um, most recently, about a year ago, uh, I have an adult daughter who decided to take a divergence in her career path and enrolled in, in a uh, course curriculum and got all the way through it and then found that that online provider um, canceled one of the required courses because they didn't have enough uh, attendees to run the course for whatever reason and that's the explanation I've been getting and it's now been months of an impediment to get this last requirement done to get a degree from this institution. Now in my professional career I'm required to take continuing education on a regular basis for a couple of different licenses that I hold and uh, what I notice is that the Commissioner of Commerce uh, approves courses for continuing education and so that it's uh, universally accepted with regard to renewing your license. And as part of a broader discussion for those uh, institutions that operate within our state borders, and I certainly don't discourage private colleges or private institutions from giving students more choice, but I might suggest that as we go forward, you might entertain uh, with regard to policy that maybe colleges have to gain uh, commissioner approval that these courses are approved for instruction and that they're transferable to any institution, that a student isn't lost in the shuffle of deciding to transfer to another school or another college and then having a lot of their work kind of go down the drain and is only unique to a certain course or curriculum that, uh, or a degree that it, an institution is offering. So that might be a little bit of a pathway where some of this could be, could be resolved. Um, and then lastly, and I think somebody touched on it already, is that there probably ought to be, uh, with any institution, uh, some other pathway that's established uh, with a with a competitor or whether it's state run that um, certain credits earned or whatever are fully a, applicable to a, a curriculum and uh, allow that person to uh, finish up their degree and not not be lost in the shuffle because this is kind of a, a tragedy time in real estate time is of the essence time is money and uh, for people who are 
uh, trying to get a degree and get an education. They've got goals. They've got, may, they might be married students. They, they might have family obligations, whatever. So these are just, uh, Chair Carlson, some thoughts that I've had about some of the inequities of, of really not knowing when you're signing up, you kind of blindly, especially when you're young, you're blindly think, well, this is an institution and it'll be there as long as I'm enrolled in class. And now we're finding that there are surprises and it, it's really a tragedy that somebody might have two or three years invested in, in a four-year degree or, or even in a, an associate degree and then find they're basically uh, three steps forward and two steps backwards and shuffling to start all over again. So this doesn't help getting people into the workforce. It doesn't help satisfy the, the needs that are there with regard to uh, filling the, the great vacancies and jobs that we have. And, and um, maybe this is something that kind of look forward. So there's a little bit of uniformity, uh, regardless of who you are as an institution and that students can uh, move expeditiously in getting their degree. Thank you. Representative Skowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, <coughs> just curious, uh, Argosi, are they their nationwide uh, institution? Uh, is there anything of them left? And uh, what uh, characterize again? I heard sixty-two thousand dollars that you're in pursuit of. Uh, have you exhausted all efforts to recover the taxpayer funds, Mr. Olson, or, or Ms. Delbin? Representative Carlson. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know. Joskowski, Representative Joskowski. Um, uh, so I, I'm going to give a, a little bit of overview of who Argus University was, because I think that's important for this committee. Um, Argus University was part of a corporately owned school system, and they had uh, originally four brands, but at the time of their closure, they were down to three. And their corporate owner was a holding company called Dream Center Educational um, Holdings. It's The acronym is DCEH. And uh, they were national. They were in um, a, the majority of states between the Art Institute, South University, and Argus University. When, and they were actually a very recent purchaser of the school systems. They closed uh, uh, the purchase on October of 2017, which in, in higher education world, that's not a very long period of time to fail, as they failed actually before um, and so and I think the, the interesting thing is when the, the new, per, uh, new owner took over the schools, they found out very quickly that they had no money. The school was not self-supporting. It had too many liabilities, uh, particularly leases that were very expensive and with declining enrollment nationally, they couldn't support their overhead anymore. And with how the corporate structures were set up, uh, they ran out of money very quickly. So 2018 was basically the year of not paying bills. And they did a very effective job of obscuring that from regulators. And in about Ju June or July of 2018, they tried to find new purchasers of those schools. And some of them were successfully sold, uh, and that closed on January 7th, but did not include the Argosy University brand because of its corporate structure. The other brands, each location was its own LLC, and it allowed them to get rid of those liabilities of bad leases and things that they couldn't afford anymore and they were not viable for those, those school systems. But they could not do that with Argus University. And they really needed to find that one purchaser of Argus University. And that obviously did not happen. And so by the time we entered into receivership, the entity was not solvent. I think they already had about $300 million in bills that they could not pay. Um, and again, that's how financial aid got so quickly absorbed. And it wasn't until the receivership occurred and there was a lot of court oversight of the institutions themselves uh, where they had to report these types of debts and obligations. I call receivership bankruptcy light. It's basically like we need to be protected by the court because we can't afford our bills any longer and we need to be able to renegotiate those expenses and shed them and, and then either to come back out of receivership as a successful business or uh, be sold um, to a new entity minus all the liabilities. And that's where we end up finding out about those funds that were labeled Minnesota State Grant. And yes, we are doing everything that we can to make the taxpayer whole. Um, and I, I hope anyone who's unfortunately been involved in the court systems, we do move very slowly. Um, and I'm a, a lawyer by trade, and we've already intervened, so we're, we're, we're noted in the court as an interested party. And because the receivership actually was terminated on Friday due to um, misdeeds by the federal receiver, um, we have to file 
all of our paperwork by May 10th to get those funds. So it should move fairly quickly at this point because of what's happened in the receivership to again to get to get the, the state whole um, before they enter into bankruptcy because once they get done with that receivership on May 10th, or I think it's May 31st, um, they have to go into federal bankruptcy. So we want to get in there before that and get it resolved because once things are in bankruptcy, we have a lot less um, control over how money is used and spent. Representative Skelson. Thank you so much. And uh, Representative Vogel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I also want to thank you for, for doing this. One of the people I work with um, was affected. Um, she's been working her way with a part-time job as well as through school. And I think she was in her last um, semester or quarter. And uh, I, I happened to be working that day with, and she was there, um, and we talked about how, and she was just devastated because she didn't know what to do. So um, I, I applaud the efforts. Uh, question that I have is, are, are these institutions, and I, I understand the corporate complexity of the holding companies and so forth, but are, are we getting um, audited financial statements from them? I'm not sure which just Representative Carlson, Representative, is it Vogel? Um, yes, we do, but the problem with audited financials is um, they're late. They come in, you, the fiscal, let's say they run on a fiscal year like we do with June 30th, so July 1st to June 30th, and audited financials come in, um, you know, you submit, you have to close out, that normally is a 30-day process, and then you have to send it to your CPA firm to get them audited, and that's probably another three-month process. So what we found with another institution that actually just closed their doors within Minnesota very quickly, they gave us four days notice, is that these institutions, because enrollment is down so much, are even running out of cash between those five month period of time. And so what we've had to do instead is when we start seeing these red flags with declining enrollment as a trigger for us, that we start requesting quarterly unaudited financials so that we can monitor this more closely. We actually have something that we call a closed school protocol. Um, we, it doesn't mean that you are closing as an institution, but we've put you in the zone of what you are highly at risk for closing. And therefore we start doing certain requirements and monitoring steps, which includes the, um, we need to start finding transfer pathways. What we have found with institutions is they don't call it quits fast enough. They wait until the absolute last moment. And there's one, one good, really good reason is it harms students to close. Because transfer credits are a problem. Students are not able to move their credits as quickly. Institutions that negotiate transfer pathways and teach outs with institutions, they go out of date very quickly because students, schools change their programs very rapidly. The markets change, um, enrollment demographics change. And so we're finding that those agreements don't end up being any worthwhile, which is why our office has had to step in. And we have much greater success negotiating those transfer pathways. We actually get the curriculum and academic and faculty information from the school so that we can provide that to institutions on a much more neutral basis to say, we need to help these students as a community. Um, and, and so again, schools are not call, calling into the last minute um, and they're competitors. These are competing programs in the moment um, an institution says I might be failing. We have actually had other the competing institutions go and put flyers on the students' dashboards, which is to destine the school's failure. And so we have that boundary of they call it too late, but they don't want to call it too early because they might financially survive. And so we're trying to find that happy medium between students for students so that they can complete their program, but not cause harm to other students too. So we're working on it. We're trying. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and, and the question was, uh, uh, 10 years ago, um, it, those of you that are sitting around the table might remember there was a slight banking crisis. <laughs> I happened to experience it firsthand. And one of the interesting things back then was this, this confidence thing that, sh that she's talking about because um, there were institutions that were in severe distress. But if the customer base was alerted to that, it became more distressful. And, and that was the reason for the, the, the question is, uh, you know, just going forward to being, to, you know, the, 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 the uh, uh, ideal is to be able to set up a 
uh, early warning system where we're getting the information financially that kind of tips us to what's going on. And as I'm listening to this explained, obviously with the new acquisition that happened, it's a little harder to follow because there was financials that were interrupted and, and, and redone. But uh, I, I appreciate the efforts and just, um, you know, working through this stuff so that we have systems in place that are, are kind of able to what I would call risk rate these institutions so that we're getting the early warning and you can do the remediation hopefully before it happens or at least work through it so that the students aren't inconvenient. So my, my compliments to the way you're approaching this because I can tell what the answers that you're giving that you're, you're really trying your best and uh, <laughs> just uh, brings back all of these memories that I wish I hadn't had. Thank you. <laughs> Something that even predates me is the May <coughs> holiday I happen to think of when you were uh, talking about that, that, you know, back during the FDR years because of the concern about the run on banks and what have you during the uh, Depression. Um, Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, being a numbers geek, Representative Ogle kind of took all my thunder, but I have a couple of <laughs> follow-ons. Um, I do think that what Representative Vogel uh, touched on um, Chair Bernardi, for future consideration, just like in the banking and the financial industries, I came from that similar background, we were obligated to go under stress tests and provide those to FINRA and, and uh, to uh, other agencies of the federal ordinance that uh, provided them with evidence that we could carry. I'm just wondering, just like a bank uh, provides, do private uh, colleges, private, private universities, much like other, along with the stress tests, are they obligated to carry reserves or some type of a bond, surety bond, that uh, would uh, cover the uh, outlay from the state so that we could recover or that the uh, students themselves could recover for the uncompleted portion of their uh, certificate or their degree program? Ms. Nolan. Uh, Representative, uh, I can't see your name. Albright. 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 Um, Yes, and that was one of the things that uh, Representative Bernardi kind of alluded to is that what we're finding is that surety requirement, that reserves, well, one, we don't have a mandatory reserves requirement, um, we, which is not a bad idea. I mean, it's an option that should be explored. And that's actually one of the things I love. I love this committee hearing because we've gotten so many interesting feedback items um, to consider. And so there's no minimum reserve requirement like a bank would have. And what, what we do have is a surety requirement, and it's behind schedule by about two years. And so an institution is tied, our surety requirement is tied to the U.S. Department of Education's surety requirement, which is about two years old. So if institutions are running out of cash too fast, we're not knowing, we're not, ha we're not triggering that surety requirement. And it's a very low surety requirement. It's capped at 250,000. So we do have an institution here operating in the state of Minnesota that has a surety requirement of about a billion dollars with the US Department of Education to cover their losses in the event the institution closes. But ours is 250,000. That's slightly problematic um, for obvious reasons because we know if you have a population of 40,000 students, you can imagine how, how little of a refund that they would get. We would probably pay more in postage and, and to process a check than the student would receive. And we did attempt to, to try to increase that. Things are different now. Maybe we'll, we can try to do that again in the future is to, to <coughs> eliminate or change that cap. Um, but we also have to have better mechanisms like with the stress test to trigger that surety requirement and not just waiting for the feds to tell us that there's a problem because it's just too far behind. And, it, and we have an institution where that's exactly what happened. They ran out of money so quickly and it's not Argosy that the feds are just now asking for that surety requirement but the, the school can't afford to get it because, and they got delisted from NASDAQ for being a penny stock because they ran out of money so quickly. And that, that's not a, a system that is effective for our students and for our schools, actually. Mr. Chair, um, <clears throat> it seems like all the signs were there well in advance, and unfortunately it sounds like it was a you know, kind of a 
the, the old movie, you know, what we have here is a failure to communicate, you know, with the students. Um, and I think picking up on, on some of the things that have gone on, um, you mentioned the Federal Department of Education and higher ed is the commissioners at the table here. Um, I'm just wondering if the AG's office has been engaged in this process because this is a, this is a litigious environment mm -hmm. uh, with recovery. Uh, and you mentioned audited financials and, and I'm just wondering, it seems like there's this um, kind of fog m misting around the Argosy in terms of mismanagement of the funds that were provided to them by the state of Minnesota. And I'm, so I'm just wondering, not to cast dispersions, but it almost seems like there is a, cr not criminal, but a civil uh, um, infraction of the law. And I'm, that's why I bring up the AG's office. And I'm just wondering, has uh, that office been engaged or will they soon be? Elvin. Representative Carlson, yes, the AG's office. We uh, I'm very grateful for the relationship our office has been able to form with the Consumer Financial Protection Division, who would be responsible for enforcing these types of issues. And we do have very frequent meetings with them, um, and including whether we should be, uh, whether we, you know, we have enough evidence to provide them as a platform to move forward with other litigation. Obviously, with recovery is going to be challenging, and they have to, they have to, they get to weigh that. Um, because this institution um, is, is heading to bankruptcy and they are so broke. Um, obviously, you can move up in the priority um, if there are intentional acts that caused these things to occur. Uh, and so, yes, they are absolutely looking at those things. We've been in constant communication. We actually were in communication with them. Once we have that risk analysis happening, we immediately communicate with them so that they also know if students are complaining to them what's going on and that they can our, work with us and ask us for what they need from our records in order for their purposes. This is just a kind of an esoteric question from a bankruptcy perspective, but the asset list for Argosy or the parent company Arb Argosy has have uh, uh, measures been taken to seize or freeze the assets so that they can't be sold off in terms of the subordination to the, the creditors themselves? Uh, representatives, uh, we have not been able to do so because of the federal receivership. The receivership gives a lot of power and control of the receiver to control the assets and make enter into contracts and and just pretty much do whatever they want with the money. Um, it, is, it, it is one of the reasons why the receivership is actually being terminated, um, because, and they don't have those orders of priority in the receivership like they do in bankruptcy. Um, it's one of the reasons why the court wanted to terminate it earlier, but for some unwinding issues of the schools that just got sold in January. And so we've been blocked from that type of activity. And the court recognizes that that was not appropriate any longer, and that we institutions and other entities, other states who are actually are owed money to, need to be able to come in and get access to resources and assets. So, are you suggesting that this was a receivership filed in state court or federal court? Uh, representatives, it was filed in Ohio federal court, and uh, it. I guess, is that, does that answer your question? Well, I'm just wondering if uh, Minnesota is a party to that receivership and when did that occur? Ms. We, we did file as an interested party and as permission for our AG's office to intervene already. Um, and that ha happened pretty early on in the process just because basically once the school actually announced its closure, uh, all before that, our office was trying to communicate with the receiver in the schools to make students whole. Um, we became aware of the, the, what this bill is about, that students weren't receiving their money um, at the end of January and early of February. So we were going through the prescribed uh, statutory uh, you know, administrative action process. And then when the receiver in the school actually closed on March 8th, um, that is when we kind of entered into the mode of recovery and trying to resolve how we can make students whole. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Well, thank you, uh, and I apologize if you've covered this while I had to step out, but I'd like to go back to the issue of students and them getting placed. Uh, do you have any idea how many students had to go out of state to find uh, resources or a school that could help them in their Ms. education? Uh, representatives, uh, Representative Turkles, I th it depends on the program. Their Argosy, one of their distinctions and what made them as successful in the Twin Cities is their unique health science programs. And they were mostly at the undergraduate level and also at the graduate level for health sciences. And for example, they had one of the largest in, 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 uh, for histotechnology, which is an associate degree program that's needed by hospitals, and also sonography, dental hygiene, um, and those students were very hard to place. Uh, so, like the Histotech students are, some of them are going through UND, some of them are able to go to Mayo. Um, the other, we have four students who have not been able to be placed at this time from that program. We do have, so we ended up having to bifurcate students on where they were going based on how far they were in their program. Um, we found a lot of institutions, like for radiation therapy, because we have two schools who want to offer it now for, for new which will help place those students and teach them out. Um, but students who are right at the end of their program, they're not leaving the state, but they're doing them remotely. And then we do have, we, so it's kind of a mix, like they're attending out of state institutions, but they're doing it remotely. Um, and then other students, because um, it took some time for this ID program, it's the doctorate in clinical psychology. We just had two institutions announced that they're gonna try to come to the state. And one of them is already in state, it's Augsburg University, is gonna offer that program. It, for, for the long term, not just teach out the currently enrolled students. Um, but it took time. I mean, it's, it's, is it May 1st? Today, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm losing track of time. It's May Day. Okay. So it's May 1st, and the school closed um, uh, March 8th. And we already had students in that program because there was no other option in, in the state of Minnesota sell their houses and try to move to out of state. And that's never the ideal. But um, so there are students, yes, who are leaving out of state. We'll be able to run a report. Uh, probably late fall, uh, once the data starts coming in, the enrollment data, to find out where these students landed. And if it is out of state, we won't necessarily have that data because we don't get enrollment data from out of state. But we do hope to know, you know who went on to graduate or who went on to transfer and um, how many unknowns we have, which would be distributed between students who didn't go on and enroll anywhere or they enrolled out of state. I think there just be follow up. So, the, does the department take a role in that, in, in in helping to helping the students and helping to kind of facilitate that negotiation between the student and a potential institution that might be able to finish their degree or get them into a program and not and avoid taking advantage of them in the process? Ms. Helen, Representative Carlson, Representative Turkleson, yes. Uh, whether it should be our lane. I'm not sure, <laughs> but we do do it because it's in the best interest of students, which is why we collect all that academic information and um, hopefully none of the private institutions are mad at me in the state, but I'm pretty aggressive at contacting them and, and getting them to look at the curriculum and help these students transfer. We publish them on our website. I also get um, student contact information and I'm able to send targeted emails to all students. So a school will approach me and say, hey, I'm offering a teach out for this business program. And I'll say, great, I'm gonna just prepare what you want me to say to the students and then I will email it to all of the students who are in that program. And that way, um, they have the information live when it becomes available. They can also keep checking our website. Um, and then if the schools ever have questions about the curriculum or what would be in the best interest of students and how to place them, they do communicate with us on a regular basis. Because in this case, there was not a surviving institution to communicate with. And so normally, this should have been done by Argosy. This should have been done by DCEH. Um, but we find, again, they're calling it too late in the game, and they don't leave enough resources for them to the schools themselves as obligated by the accreditor and the U.S. Department of Education and our office to do it. So we just assume that role on their behalf. Rep. Parkinson, thank you. Uh, Rep. Tim Scott. Just one last question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I know, you know, if, you, if you're out of school in March and you can't get in to another school for a, more than a six month period of time, your student loans start kicking in. Is there any deferment plan that's in place for these kids or these students? Ms. Uh, Representative Carlson, Representative Scott, um, I, 
what's interesting about this case is yes and no. Um, the department actually discharged all of their spring aid, every student. And so if they had loans from spring semester, they no longer have those loans. But if they had loans from a prior term, which many of them do, um, they do technically go into repayment, but they can request a hold. Uh, they can request basically a forbearance after that. Uh, the goal is always to get them placed before those six months occur. Um, we do have a couple of programs because they're cohort based, like you just start day one and then the next year the group two comes um, and those are the students who are going to be the most problematic and that for example that's the dental hygiene program and those students are going to have to request uh, a discharge or forbearance. a forbearance some of those students are going to have to start over like it doesn't make any difference financially if they start over or not because of the loss of income versus the loss of credits. And so those students, we, we do provide them that advice to also they could explore applying for a closed school discharge and get those loans just wiped out if they have to restart the program anyways um, because it would it's just financially advantageous to get to, to have those loans discharged. Thank you. Uh, seeing none, would you, oh, okay. Representative Dabbert. Thank you uh, for the indulgence. Indulgence, Mr. Chair. Just one question is occurring to me as you talk about discharge of loans and like, are students going to run the risk of a negative impact on their credit score because of any of the financial implications uh, in this? Ms. Talbot. Uh, I might need some clarification. If a student does not work with their servicer and kind of ignores the paperwork they get right. after the six months, absolutely. Right. Um, as long as they stay in communication with us, even though we have no impact on those federal loans, we're giving them what advice about what they need to do um, and referring them to their loan servicer, they can avoid all of those problems. Um, the, we have heard from many students that the closed school discharges are already being processed. So that's really good that they're getting um, ahead of the game. And I will say that pros and cons, the, the current administration at the federal level is prioritizing these Argosy student claims because there's 100,000 plus claims from the uh, prior school closures like Corinthian and um, ITT that haven't been processed, but they are processing the Argosy ones right now. Okay. Thank you. It was just another dimension. Of the Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, ma'am. Representative Albright. Representative Davney brought up a good question, and I know that in terms mean very different things to the tax man. Mm -hmm. And so whether a loan is forgiven or discharged, it, mean, it means a, a very much a, a key difference when you're filing your tax return in the year in which that uh, loan was discharged or forgiven, whether or not you're going to receive a 1099. If you want to rub salt in the wound for these people, <laughs> you better not uh, show that as an income receipt to those folks at the end of the year. So I just want to alert you oh, to right. that, make sure that we are we making sure that these folks who have been really, really harmed are not paying over and above and that that discharge is, is, for, is not included as an, as an income on their 1040. Ms. Albright. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Representative Carlson, Representative Albright. The good news oh, is this week, I, it came up for the self loan issue because we're discharging the self loan. And, or, well, yeah, the, there is a specific USC that, dis, that a closed school discharge or an unpaid refund discharge is not taxable. And so that is very clear under federal law that any of these discharges that students have received is not a taxable event at the federal level. And Mr. Chair, Representative Albright, the, the language in the bill uh, specific to the Minnesota self loan does have uh, the term reverse, which we believe does not uh, include in tax impact to the students and can 100% guarantee that, but have written the language in such a way that will greatly reduce the tax impact to students, if at all. Okay, any further uh, discussion? Uh, <coughs> Ms. Bernardi, would you like, or Rep. Bernardi, would you like to uh, do your motion? Yes, I will. I'd like to do that, but I just want to just pause for a moment, and you can probably, what a, an amazing public servant we have here with uh, Betsy Talbot. She has gone above and beyond and has really made a difference in the lives of these students when they face these marriage year challenges. So I want to give credit for that and thank her for all of her work. 
I will uh, second that. In fact, uh, just a side conversation a couple of moments ago that I had with Ms. Conley to my right, uh, I said I was really pleased as to um, how you seem to be on top of this whole situation. The agency, Mr. Olson, but Ms. Talbot in particular, who did most of the testimony, testifying here today, uh, you seem to be very much on top of the issue, and thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, the motion. Okay. I renew my motion that House File 2849, as amended, be recommended to be referred to the Committee on Rules and in Legislative Administration. Okay, and uh, just for the benefit of the committee, after it goes to rules, it will need to go to government operations, and I've uh, already had a conversation with uh, Representative Freiburg, so he knows it's uh, on the way. So uh, with that, uh, any further discussion? Seeing none then, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Chair Carlson and members. The, uh, we will um, uh, likely be meeting uh, next week. Uh, we're watching the uh, floor activity closely, and uh, we have to match the activities in this committee with the floor schedule. So. Uh, watch for announcements about when we'll be uh, meeting next week because we do have some legislation that we'll have to move out of committee yet. So with that, uh, meeting adjourned.